29th, 1.35 p.m. here Pacific Time. And I'm going to be talking to Dr. Douglas Petrovich, a returning guest of the program today, and discuss this Mount Elba curse tablet. It looks like it's the oldest Hebrew inscription we've ever found. There's a lot of questions surrounding this. It's a pretty big find, pretty significant. Definitely relates to apologetics. Definitely important for the Bible. Definitely important for archaeology. And we're going to talk about it here today. Don't go anywhere. How you doing? Welcome back to the program, my friend. <laughs> oh, I O. <laughs> I'll be visiting Columbus end of June, early July. Oh, a trip to Mecca. Good for you. Yeah, I'm going to see how the old city religion is doing. Because you know yeah. the city's religion is the Buckeyes. That's right. Well, we're here to talk about a different religion. You have got a number of publications on academia.edu, plus these expensive but beautiful books. And in fact, some people were even known to get autographs. Yep. You buy it from the right place. Shout out to Rox B for allowing me to get this book. Thank you, Rox B, for your help. How could people find this and other wonderful materials because you got a lot of good stuff out there well vocab they can go to my academia.edu webpage um, you probably have to be a member of academia to to move around freely everywhere on that and see everything that i have maybe but it's worth it uh there's no cost and you can find a lot of my materials for free especially my journal articles that have been published in peer-reviewed journals uh, i think i have eight articles already uh, that have been published, and then lots of teaching materials, a um, couple of uh, translations I have up there, and and, and uh, outlines of books of the Bible. So there's that, and then there's Twitter. You can always um, go to Twitter, especially if you're interested in buying one of my books directly from me, which can get you a signature and get me a better um, royalty. You can um, look me up on Twitter and um, and get either Origins of the Hebrews or the World's Oldest Alphabet from there. Excellent. We had you on before, and we talked about the general chronology and timeline of the Hebrew Bible, but specifically in regards to the Exodus 400 or 430 years and how that fits in with a larger picture. Great program. I encourage everyone to go back and check that out. But today, we're here to talk about this little guy right here. This little guy right here. When I say little guy... I mean, like, fit in the palm of your hand and not even take up much space, right? Yep. Tiny little guy. And uh, the way we're going to do it here, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm going to read from an article from the magazine Artifacts. It's a biblical archaeology news magazine. This is from the Spring 22 edition. I am a subscriber. I encourage you to subscribe as well. And uh, I believe you're affiliated with them, correct? I am. In fact, they supposedly, I haven't seen it yet, but they just wrote uh, a review of my new book in there. Well, the yeah. you know, um, I was reading this, and I can confirm on page 18 they did write a review of your yeah. book. Nice. I can't wait to uh, get my own copy. Well, maybe I'll send you one if I'm filling up for <laughs> it. Okay, so this is from the very beginning. I'm going to read, and then you interrupt me, and we're and you're going to explain it. Because everyone, this is a big deal. This is a big deal, and you're going to find out why. But it's going to be a little bit of technical stuff, so hang in there today and comment in the live chat. Here we go. Ancient curse inscription deciphered from tablet found during archaeological wet sift on Mount Ebal. That's a headline. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Associates for B F Associates for uh, Biblical Research, that's ABR, announced at a Houston conference on March 24, 2022, the discovery of a formulaic curse recovered on a small folded leaf, I'm sorry, lead tablet. This defixio, mm -hmm. as it's called, came to light in December 2019 when archaeologist Scott Scripling, director of the AB 
uh, Archaeological Archaeological Studies Institute at the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas, led an ABR team to wet sift the discarded material from Adam Zertal's excavations, 1982 to 1989, Mount Ebal. The ancient Hebrew inscription consists of 40 letters and is centuries older than any known Hebrew inscription from ancient Israel. Stripling formed a collaboration with four scientists from the act. Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic and two epigraphers, specialists in deciphering ancient texts. Peter Gert van der Veen of Johannes Gutenberg University Mainz and Gershon Galil of the University of Haifa. The scientists employed advanced tomographic scans to recover the hidden text. And here's the last part I read and I'm going to hand it over to you. In collaboration with Stripling, Galil and Van der Veen deciphered the proto-alphabetic inscription, which reads as follows. Cursed, cursed, cursed. Cursed by the god Yahweh. You will die cursed. Cursed, you will surely die. Cursed by Yahweh. Cursed, cursed, cursed. And now you can see why it's called a curse tablet. Okay, decipher what we just read there a little bit and help everyone understand and then i'll continue reading because that's my contribution to today's show <laughs> sure and obviously that's kind of a negative inscription isn't it i mean we don't usually get inscriptions that are that uh, mean if you will um and it goes back well it reminds me of a um a little quip that one of my professors my old testament hebrew professor had which is good things happen to those who are blessed bad things happen to those who are cursed. And whoever is the object of that cursing, um, from, from all intents and purposes, what we know, that person exper or persons experience some really bad things. Uh, again, that's the purpose of the curse tablet. And we see curses in the Bible that are fulfilled, right? When people are cursed, bad things happen to them. So probably the same is true with the person behind this, um, uh, this curse tablet. So again, it's, as vocab mentioned, it's extremely small. It's probably about this big in size, the, uh, the cursed tablet. And it was found in a wet sifting project. Uh, so excavations from, I believe it was the 1980s uh, at Mount Ebal. And that is, um, if you want, if you will, it's north of Jerusalem. It's up uh, in the higher country. So the city of Shechem was kind of in the middle and Mount Gerizim is kind of to the lower left, and then to the upper right is Mount Ebal. So um, the blessings are connected with Mount Gerizim, and Mount Ebal um, is connected with curses. So um, it was shortly into the conquest, and remember, that, um, if our dates are right for the Exodus at 1446, and the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites in 1406 to 1400, and we're talking right in that period, 1406 to 1400, in that window, um, there is a description in, um, what is it, uh, Joshua 8, I believe it is, where um, th this activity with Joshua and the Israelites and God takes place at Mount Ebal, and there's, um, there's the building of an altar there. So if you go to the site today, um, you can see that it was excavated, and they found a square altar that was dated by Zertal to, I think it was around 1250 BC, if, if memory serves, right around there, 1250 BC, uh, for that square altar. But in the middle of that square altar, and then under the ground, in other words, basically underneath it as an underlying feature, was a smaller and circular altar that's two meters in diameter. Again, it's circular, so you know you picture that it's two meters anywhere you, anywhere you shape it from from one end to the other. And uh, that is considered to be probably Joshua's altar. In fact, Scott Stripling, I think, is going to be arguing that in future publications very vehemently, that this altar, this round altar, is the one connected with, with Joshua's time period. Now, not too far away from that altar, in fact, just outside of the larger square altar, the later altar of around 1250 B.C., was found a scarab, and that scarab has a king's cartouche on it, which means it's the name, one of the royal names of the king. As I probably told you last time, every king had five official names. So his throne name, one of the five, uh, was on there, and it's Men Heper Ra. 
great are the or great is the manifestation of Ra. Ra being one of the uh, gods connected to the sun. So it's it's a sun disk god, if you will. Um, and that name is given to what the person we know today, the king we know today, as Futmos the third or Tutmose the third. He is the father of the Exodus Pharaoh, oddly enough. So Amenhotep II, his son, became the Exodus Pharaoh. Uh, Thutmose III, he was the king who chased Moses out of Egypt after Moses killed an Egyptian. And then Moses spent all that time in Midian. And after many decades, in fact, it was after 40 years, um, Thutmose III died. And that's that's confirmed historically as far as the length of his reign. We know he ruled into his 54th year, which is astonishing. Hmm. It's kind of like uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Right, 70 so, years or so. Yeah. So this this scarab demonstrates that there were people running around the altar area at, at Mount Abal, which again, it's out in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's, it's a small, it's a hill, somewhere between a hill and a small mountain, like a foothill, if you will. So... Who's going to be running around there carrying a scarab from the reign of Thutmose III if those people aren't connected somehow to Thutmose III? And again, he ruled until 1450 BC. That's when he died, and that's four years before the Exodus. So if one of the Israelites is carrying on his person a scarab with Thutmose III's cartouche on it, it's easy to understand how in 1406 to 1400, um, that person or that person's child, whatever, uh, would have that scarab and purposefully or accidentally lose it uh, right near the altar. So that suggests to us that the round altar may date as early as not too long after the reign of Thutmose the Third. So this this whole this whole um, earlier altar could be Joshua's altar that was built there that we read about in the Bible. Now back to the inscription. The inscription then. Um, vocab either connects to that early the earlier altar that was there so that's sometime after Thutmose the third's reign or to the 1250 bc era now it's it's known as being found or or um uh, discovered out of context out of archaeological account uh, context in other words it wasn't find found in, in what we would call a stratified layer where, for example, there's an occupational phase at some certain city, and we know when that phase was based on the material that was found there, and we know the parameters, for example, of when people first moved there and then when they moved uh, away from there or when it was destroyed. So it could be that this inscription dates to, for example, that, that later altar period. But the problem is that the paleographically, the way that the letters are written the, the forms, the shapes, where they fit in, and, and, and yeah, there there are three forms of the letter right there that you're showing us. Um, the forms of those letters suggest to us it's not the later time period of that second square altar, but it's probably the earlier time period. Um, again, based on the shapes of the letters. And you can find all of that vocab in um, the first... In my first book, The World's Oldest Alphabet, and it's the first chart that's in there, and it's my alphabetic chart right there. So in that chart, you can see um, the various Hebrew letters and how they looked at whatever time, there, there it is, at whatever time period in history. And you can match the letters that you see in this inscription, and especially once it's published. They didn't publish fully on this yet. It's going to be around the end of the summer, we're told. But that will demonstrate from, from the letters that are visible and what they tell us that the forms of the letters are earlier. So they're probably end of what's called Late Bronze Age one or beginning of Late, Late Bronze Age two, around 1400 BC. Either way, would it not – so there's a number of options there. My understanding is whichever one a person went with, this still would be the oldest Hebrew text that we found. Ah, okay, so I know you might disagree because of certain views. Big time disagree with that one. Most people are saying that, right? <laughs> yes, most people are saying that. Um, and then when I when I kind of blew the horn on that one, it was changed to the oldest inscription in Hebrew inscription in Canaan. It's not. 
It's the third or fourth oldest Hebrew inscription in Canaan. Thank you. So just so wow. just so everyone knows, I may not explain it right, but Dr. Petrovich, he is pushing uh, a hypothesis that you can see a little bit actually in uh, patterns of evidence. I think it's the Moses controversy, the second yep. one in the series by Tim That's Mahoney. It. And you can get a sense of it there. Obviously, it's going to be, uh, obviously, in this book, the world's oldest alphabet as well. And uh, so he he would have a, a more nuanced view, a different view as far as this being the oldest. Most, most people, though, are going to say, as far as if you hear this talked about, this is the world's oldest Hebrew inscription. Dr. Petrovich and maybe some other people you've, convinced would disagree but either way it's super early yeah it's super early the oldest inscription dates to 1840 bc it's found in sinai um and that's in my book it's discussed there that's um uh sinai 377 um so there are lots of inscriptions from from the middle kingdom period a number of inscriptions from the middle kingdom period and so that's dynasty 12 and dynasty 13 and then we start getting a lot in Dynasty 18, the date to the middle of the 15th century BC. Um, and those are found again in Egypt and Canaan, uh, especially, uh, I'm sorry, in Egypt and Sinai, and especially in Sinai. And, um, and in Canaan, though, we have two that date to the Middle Bronze Age. Um, one being, it's called the Lachish Dagger. It's probably around 1650 BC, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit later. Um, and um, that inscription, uh, it consists of only four letters, but that's clearly proto-consonantal Hebrew alphabet. And so it's written in Hebrew letters, probably Hebrew. And then there's the, um, uh, the, the second oldest one is the Gezer Potsherd, which dates to between, it's around, it's around 1600 or so probably BC, uh, found at the site of Gezer. So those are the two oldest ones easily. Possibly the third oldest one is, is one that we talked about, I think, in our last um, interview together, the Lachish Milk Bowl Ostrichen, which I published on. Yeah, because you'd written an article on that yep. for, uh, hold on, hold on, for Bible yeah, in Spain. Bible in Spain. That may be the third oldest inscription, Hebrew inscription we know about. I'm sorry, in Canaan, the third oldest inscription in Canaan, Hebrew inscription in Canaan we know about. Um, if it's... If not, that's the fourth, and the Mount Ebal ins inscription is the um, is the third. So it's one or the other is is the third oldest. And Hebrew Bible and Spade is another magazine I encourage people to subscribe to, in yep. regards to biblical archaeology. And uh, if I could, I return now to the artifacts article yes. where we where we left off. <laughs> According to Stripling, these types of amulets are well known in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, but Zertal's excavated pottery dated to the Iron Age I and Late Bronze Age, so logically, the tablet derived from one of these earlier periods. Even so, our discovery of a Late Bronze Age inscription stunned me. And that's the end of that quote. Almost immediately, Galil recognized the formulaic literary structure of the inscription. Quote, from the symmetry, I could tell that it was written as a chiastic parallelism. I always had pr uh, trouble pronouncing that even in seminary, but it's like those little funny poems that kind of go, well, yeah. it doesn't have to be a poem, but poetic structure that goes like, like an axe. Yeah. Yeah, that's a way to do it. That's a way to do it. Okay, and then it says, um, reading the concealed letters uh, proved tedious, ac according to Van der Veen, quote, but each day we recover new letters and words written in a very ancient script, end quote. Daniel Vavrik and his colleagues from Prague ensured the accuracy of the raw data which the team interpreted. According to Deuteronomy 27 and Joshua 8, Mount Ebal was the mountain of the curse. And again, everyone, I want you to just stop. I'm going to continue reading. Think about how significant it is that you have Mount Ebal, because remember, they stood on Gerizim and Ebal, and one was the blessing side, one was the cursing side. So sometimes I always think of this as like a, a pep rally for the covenant, where, you know, you've got uh, uh, two teams, and one is like, you know, curse, and one is blessing, you know, and you have them over there. Uh, here at Mount Ebal is the curse team, the curse side, and we found a curse tablet. Now, I want everyone to be clear. This inscription is not a biblical text. It's not literally, just so everyone knows, uh, just so this is not from the Bible. These words are not from 
anywhere in the Torah or Tanakh or anything like that. But obviously they're reflecting uh, something going on, and we're going to talk about this, but the significance of the divine name, the personal divine name is there as well. But according to Deuteronomy 27 and Joshua 8, Mount Ebal is the mountain of the curse. Joshua 8.30 indicates that Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal. That's something we discussed. The defixio derived from previously excavated and discarded material from a structure as a tall believe was Joshua's altar. An academic peer-reviewed article was in process and will be published later in 2022. The collaborative team consists of Scott Stripling, Gershon Galil, Ivana Kumpova, uh, Jaroslav Valak, Peter Gert van der Veen, Daniel Vavrik, and Michael Vopolinsky. I apologize for any of those names I messed up. So I'm going to continue reading, but um, basically, guys, understand, and the next part of the article is about this, but Stripling requested to sift through <laughs> Zertal's trash from the 80s. And so in this thing called wet sifting, which we're going to talk about here in a second, they found this. And, and if people um, aren't familiar with this, other things have been discovered this way. I believe Hezekiah's inscription, uh, the, the Hezekiah, I think I think that was discovered this way. I forget what it's called. but the, Yeah, the little bula of Yeah, Hezekiah. bula. That's it. Yeah. The, the, the bula was discovered the same way as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is this this happens because, you know, uh, okay, here's this pile of stuff. We can't go through all of it now. And also, some of it had to do with technology because I guess there's like a lead casing that's folded and they couldn't unfold it, but they used technology to see on the inside. Is that, that exactly? Yeah. Exactly. And and the conventional thinking has always been you can't really see through lead. That's part I mean, of Superman can't even do it. Exactly. Yeah. His vision is not enough. If Superman but, can't see through lead, why would we expect archaeologists like Zertal to be able to? Well, now through modern technology, we can. And guess what we found? <laughs> yep, exactly. And and that's the beauty of it. This this uh, is so delicate, this um, cursed tablet. Uh, and again, made of very, very old lead that has been you know fused together. And so if you try to pull it apart, it would just break into little brittle pieces. So they finally found, it took a while, but finally found um, a, a kind of technology in a lab that had that kind of apparatus that could look inside of lead. Uh, in Prague, um, I think the city of Prague in the Czech Republic is where it was located. Yeah, they should so call that helped this them to the, be able uh... to penetrate the lead, see on the inside, and read what was on one side of the inner side of it and then on the other side of the inner side of it. Should have been called like the Super Superman machine or something. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Lex Luthor. Yeah, something. This stunning announcement was widely covered across the globe. Full disclosure, Scott Stripling is vice president of the Near Eastern Archaeological Society, it's an, uh, which is also a, a journal. Uh, th there's a journal published under that name, a little more technical, but that's something else I'd encourage people to get a hold of, which is one of the publishers of Artifacts, which is the magazine that we have right here. And again, that is what we're talking about today, the Mount Ebal Curse Tablet. Joshua 8, 30 through 31 states that Joshua built an altar of sacrifice on Mount Ebal out of uncut field stones in the period from 1982 to 1989 hoffa university archaeologist adam zertal now deceased discovered and excavated such an altar constructed out of uncut field stones again it's it's difficult people can this all be coincidental you know put this together everybody abr team member frankie snyder was the first person who saw this small tablet on her wet sifting screen this is fascinating now i've heard a bunch of people are signing up to want to go on excavations and stuff like that because of this is what i've been hearing you know which is which is cool it measures only about one inch by three fourths of an inch and had been missed by the previous dry screening she instantly recognized it as something special and summoned dig director scott stripling who confirmed her excitement wet sifting is a water intensive and labor intensive practice not commonly used in biblical archaeology until 2004 then israeli archaeologists zaki divra and gabriel Barquet, I apologize for all the names I'm butchering here, began carefully, carefully sifting the dirt excavated by the Muslim waqf when they dug out an entrance into the underground temple mount for their new El Marwani Mosque. The El Marwani Mosque is located in an area often called Solomon's Stables. Recognizing the significance of wet sifting, Stripling adopted it for all of his archaeological work, particularly at the ABR excavation at Tel Shiloh. As a test case to illustrate the importance of wet sifting, Stripling received 
received permission from Israeli officials to wet sift Tertal's cast off excavation dirt, as well as a dump pile from an earlier excavation at Tel Shiloh. I'll continue on there, but I want to make sure you're commenting on everything and don't get, we don't want to get too far ahead of the audience. Dr. Petrovich. Yeah. And so wet sifting, what it does is it allows you to see, to find, to, to, to visually discern, um, artifacts that are especially small and delicate and and even uh, may have some kind of coloration to them because when you're when you're working in a site everything has that kind of tan brownish dirt color to it you can't really see um items that may have color to them but over the over time as they they kind of uh um you know get stuck in the dirt and the mud so long they um they take on that color on the outside of them, so they have to be clean. Well, what, what wet sifting does is it allows water to fulfill that role of the cleaning so that you can see the original color of something and maybe see the shape better. And you can quickly distinguish between you know, little stones and maybe, for example, a white scarab. And scarabs are really small too. Um, they're, they're so small, they're hard to find without something like wet sifting. So, what sifting just opens up the, the um, avenues to other ways of seeing things that you can't see in normal dig conditions because you're, you're, you're going through so much dirt when you're um, excavating that you're not taking that much care, not expecting to see something um, very important that's in a, in a really small size. But when you wet sift, now you take the time and you have the, the visual effect and, and the cleaning agent of the water that come to play that allow you to find things. It's a special kind of water, I imagine? No, no. It's just regular... Uh, like tap water? Tap, it's tap water. Yeah, it's tap water. You're allowed to use just tap water? Yep. Straight old, clean tap water. Oh, man. Well, it's got chemicals in it and stuff. They're just using tap water? Yep. Yep. It it's, works. Wow. Okay, so it says wet sifting screen... Is it like, what does that mean? There's a computer image. Like, what does that mean? Your wet sifting screen. Okay, so your screen, it, it's similar to panning gold. Let's That's say what you're I was AT wondering. So it's like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's the idea. It's that kind of pan that has a screen, um, uh, a grid style screen on the bottom of it, and so everything is dumped on top, and then you're just, uh, you know, actually you're, you're spraying it with water, and you're you're throwing out rocks or, and large objects when they become clear, it becomes apparent that that's what it is. You, you, you take them out and so you, you reduce it to a small amount of things. And you, you know, once they're um, wet enough, you can start to see what you really have there. And you can you know, quickly separate the sheep from the goats, if you will. Hmm. It seems like there could be potential damage to stuff in the process, but what do I know? Okay, so it, here we go, continue with the article. It says, <clears throat> Lead curse tablets are quite common in the Roman and Byzantine periods. They frequently have not only a curse, but also the name of the persons to be cursed etched on them. It appears that this tablet does not contain the name of a cursed person. This tablet is from a much earlier period. This lead has been sourced to a mine in Greece and dated to the late Bronze Era, 12 to 1400 B.C., that fits with the biblical chronology for the Exodus conquest period of Joshua and the Judges, more strong evidence for the use of the Mount Ebal altar by ancient Israelites. I know you want to comment on that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, um, the, the fine spot is very important. Again, it's out of context, but it's... Um, it, it's found in a place that makes it clear that, that this is connected to, the, you know, this, the story we read about with, with Joshua and, and the Israelites at, at the altar. So um, the, the, the tablet is a curse formula, and that's very um, common in the ancient world. Usually, it, in fact, it was a legal transaction. It was a legal um, uh statement that's made when someone is cursed and someone is blessed so um 
yeah, you, you're you're wanting to wish bad things on someone who probably has done bad things to you. So what you do is you, and again, whatever ancient people you are, the Israelites or anyone else, you consult your deity, right, your God, and on on behalf or in the name of your God, you wish these bad things to happen to these certain people who have been doing harm to you. So somebody was doing harm to the Israelites at that time, that, or some person, person or persons, maybe it's a nation, you know, you know in the sense of a, a nationality, um, some people group in Canaan that they were combating was, was resisting them or something. And maybe that was the right opportune time to wish this bad thing on them. So it's written out in the form of a curse, uh, and they named their God with it, right? There's the word God there, and then there's the word Yahweh, which we want to get into because that's the divine name, right? Ready for that? Yes, but let's finish the article, and then we will. Okay. The Tazbeek News Agency version of this story noted, quote, Zertal's research showed the area to be a unique ritual site for offering sacrifices the dating of the altar to the period of the Israelites' entry into the land, the similarity between the excavated structure and the altar described in the Bible, and the fact that only kosher animal bones were found at the site, led the researchers to conclude that this is the altar Joshua built on Mount Ebal. End quote. Three more little paragraphs, and then that will be the end. Uh, <clears throat> our Israeli archaeologist Z. Kongsberg who assisted Zertal in the excavation of the Joshua altar, personally took this tiny tablet to a laboratory in Prague for tomography scanning, which produced sophisticated photographs that allow for the construction of a three-dimensional model for objects of this size. This virtual unfolding allowed for the identification of the curse written on the inside. True amulets were generally worn around the neck of a person and were intended to ward off curses and evil spirits. A defixio tablet typically contains a curse to be placed on an individual. Real quick, a lot of Sicilians wear, uh -huh. uh, wear a little... Uh, uh, it's sometimes called an, uh, a horn, Italian horn. And it's silly. I don't wear it because I believe I'm warding off the evil eye. But that's why some superstitious Italians wear it or Sicilians because they think it wards off the evil eye. I just do it sort of as a way to identify if someone's Sicilian, they know what it is when they see it. They're like, hey. But it's funny because a lot of Mediterranean cultures have some version of that. And I guess it goes back way to ancient times, that kind of thing, something to ward yeah. off the evil eye or something. And so it's funny because we're talking here about ambulance that are tended to do that way back then. Uh, last little two paragraphs. In Egypt in the Middle Kingdom period, circa 2000 to 1786 BC, such curses were written on pottery jars, today called ex ex execration texts. Ex execration. Ex uh, how do you say it again? Execration. Execration. Execration, execration texts, which were then smashed to pieces in order to activate the curses. So it's like you write the curse and then you smash it is the idea there right and so we'll find pieces so then we have to put them back together because they've been smashed obviously exactly and right what what you're wanting to do when you smash it in such a way is um kind of yeah activate that that smashing right that your god is going to do upon that person or those people that are your enemies that you that you uh, um, speak this curse against so um yeah it, it was all you know ritualistic yeah. In that sense. It's like a voodoo, but with pottery. Voodoo dolls, but with pottery. Yeah, absolutely. It was the common practice in the Greco Roman period to place such lead cursed tablets at religious sites and graves. But in one case, a lead cursed tablet was found at the site of a hippodrome, a chariot racetrack. It contained a curse on a chariot driver. <laughs> So I could see that either the chariot driver messed him up or who knows, maybe they were betting against him. Yeah, somebody was betting against him and he won. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, or they wanted him to lose, so the curse was to preemptively make him lose. Who knows? But anyways, right. okay, so that's the, that's the end of that article. There are other things, um, you know, there are other things, of course, uh, there. 
and in the article and stuff and um there's other stuff online or i'm sorry in the magazine there's other stuff online you can find but i didn't want to get bogged down with reading it but now let's talk about what you said you wanted to talk about which is the actual translation which they have it as cursed 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 by the god yahweh you will die cursed cursed you will surely die cursed by yahweh cursed 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 and now you know why it's called the mount ebal curse tablet but talk about the translation then Sure. And by the way, if people want to see this translation, you can just Google uh, something like Mount Ebal, E-B-A-L, Mount Ebal Curse Tablet, and you're yeah. going to find a bunch of hits. You know, look at the photos, the images, and among those images, you can find this um, translation that they offer. And um, the one that in their press conference that they showed at the bottom of it, they made this note. They said the amulet contains 40 proto alphabetic letters, 11 of which are Aleph. In the 23 word English translation of the inscription, the word curse appears 10 times, and Yehwa, the covenant name of God, appears twice. So, as they noted, this, this is written in what's called chiastic structure. What does that mean? It means that, for example, there's something written first, and then that's going to be repeated last. Then there's something written second, and that's going to be repeated next to last. And something written third, and that will be repeated third from last, etc. All the way until you get to the central point. Mm -hmm. And it's at that central point that you have the most important statement. And vocab, um, if you were to look at the entire flood narrative in Genesis 6 through 8, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Noah, the whole deal. That is formulated... Um, in a sense, poetically, in this chiastic structure. And it's that exact pattern, what's mentioned first is mentioned last, second, next to last, etc. until you get to the very center, where the center of it is this statement, um, then God remembered Noah and all those who were on the ark with him. So the whole centerpiece of the entire narrative, it's in the middle, right? That's how it's formulated, it's in the middle. And, um, and, and, and in those biblical chiastic structures, right, the ones in the Bible, uh, it's almost always something about God in the middle, right? But God remembered Noah and everybody on the earth. So it's not about the people per, per se foremost. It's about God. You know, and right. vocab, that's one of my convictions. We're way too caught up in ourselves. Um, all we want the Bible for is to squeeze out of it everything it can do to make me a better person. Not that that's bad to become a better person from the Bible. That's good. But the, the point is, there's something better. There's something deeper. There's something richer when we look outside of ourselves and understand more about who God is. And then God remembered Noah. So it's, a, it's the centerpiece that's most important. Anyway, back to this one. Amen. Um, he is the, the main character of a scripture, you know, sometimes I deal with uh, the Hebrew Israelite cult, and they'll say, Who, who's the main, main character of the Bible? And I'll say, Yahweh, or God, and they say, well, it's the Israelites. Israelite, that's the main Israel. I'll say, no, it's not Israel, because they think they're Israelites, so they want to make, I was like, These, you have a decidedly man-centered view at the beginning of this conversation. Yeah. The main character of the Bible is not Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, and just with the New Testament too, right? Yeah. The centerpiece of the New Testament is not the church. It's it's the person who built the church. Mm -hmm. It's the person who died for the church. It's it's the person who who brought the church into being out of his own um, humble sacrifice. So yeah. Um, but back to the curse and, and the structure of the curse. What's at the center of the curse? And I would actually word. In English, I would word it a little bit differently. Same words, but word it slightly different th differently than they did. So this is the newly part. inspired Petrovich translation of the exactly. Mount Ebal curse. Okay. Yep. So of the four lines that they have written, look at the third line where they write, Cursed you will surely die. Mm -hmm. So a little bit better than that would be, I think, um, surely um, cursed you will die. Right? Okay. Surely, cursed you will die. Because oh, so there is die. a person mentioned here. Surely. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a joke. So, it's a joke. Sorry. You know the old joke of, uh, you know, sh surely you can't be serious. I am, and don't call me surely. That's right. Okay. So this is our word, surely. Yeah. 
Um, and, and, and so it's the certainty of the death that's the number one main point. Because the line that goes before it, um, you will die, or you, you will die cursed, right? You will die cursed, first, second. And then after it, um, dot, will die, you will. Cursed, uh, uh, surely, you will die cursed. So the surely part of it is, is at the very center of it. It's the certainty of the death of the person. That's the highlight of it. So, but let's go back, vocab, to that statement they made at the bottom of their note, that the amulet contains 40 proto-alphabetic letters. Real quick, can I ask you a question about that? I don't know I'm interrupting your flow. Go ahead. Proto-alphabetic? Yep. That doesn't make sense to my little ears. If it's mm -hmm. before the alphabet, that means it wouldn't be alphabetic. So what well, do I mean by proto-alphabetic? Yeah, but proto means first, so it's the first alphabet. So they mean by this the the very first version of the Hebrew alphabet? Well, what they mean is um, that if you if you want to identify what script this is, that's that's a part of this inscription. If you want to identify it, it's it's connected to the first alphabetic script in history, the proto alphabetic script. And they're right. They're right on that. Well, then but, a critic would say, maybe this is just Canaanite. Yeah, exactly. And and I argue vocab strongly against that. In that article, you pointed people to on the Lachish Milk Bowl Ostrakan, which also dates to Joshua's conquest of Canaan. Um, and, and that's one of the points that, that I try to reinforce there. And in my books, too, in both of my books, I try to say, listen, listen this is not proto-Canaanite because it was not a Canaanite language behind the script. Um, it only was introduced into Canaan much after it was originally written in Egypt first and in Sinai. And that's by Asiatic people who were living there as foreigners. Well, what so do you think the, the Canaanites were speaking then? What was their language before? Um, so the, the Canaanites... Um, they did have their own script. They were speaking, um, yeah, they were speaking their own Canaanite language. I, I guess that's the best way to put it. But they did have a uh, what's called a um, uh, a um, okay. So they had their own script, and it was a um, syllabic script. So there's a consonant and a vowel together. Consonant vowel. Is, is so one image you look at it's a pictograph and that you you'd you'd, you'd speak a, a g r s l kind of consonant and then an, a vowel e e o u etc. So uh, depending on what picture you draw, it, that would be um, that would be it. So they had their own script actually the, the Canaanites. And you, um, do you like it when people call uh, like what about when people say the Phoenician script in regards to Hebrew? You probably don't like that. Yeah, I don't mind it if it's if it's at a, a later time in history. If it's a thousand BC, nine hundred BC, eight hundred, seven hundred, you know, if it's in that range, no problem. But to say that the earlier second millennium BC alphabetic script is Phoenician is a misnomer because it's not introduced to the Phoenicians. You think it's I'm like still, the cart before the horse maybe, or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. So back to this this concept of there being 40 letters in the inscription. And first I want to clarify something. And, and you can, you can um, hear about this in the original news conference when they speak about it. There is writing on the outside of it. They didn't talk about that at all on, uh, in the press conference. It, it's hopefully going to appear in the journal article that will come out at the end of the summer. But we don't know too much about the, the letters written on the outside. But on the inside, we do know a lot from what they... From what they tell us, that there are these 40 letters there. And there's a scholar who immediately came out, and he is an epigrapher, so he deals with ancient inscriptions. Christopher and is, Rolston. You know, Christopher Rolston, yep. He's, he's um, renowned as one of the top epigraphers of ancient Semitic uh, scripts, but with a caveat that his area of expertise is in the first millennium B.C., after 1000 B.C., not before that. 
He's done a little bit of work on things before that, but not too much. And that's not his area of specialty. So he, he immediately came out with a criticism. And here, here's his criticism. I'll read it to you. Um, he, he put this on his own um, blog, I think it so was. So this is on Christopher's blog. Okay. Yep. So it's a, he says this. Also, and perhaps even more importantly, even if we assume everything that Stripling, Galil, and Van Der Veen state about the readings and translation is correct, and that's a big assumption, they have told us that there are 40 letters. They also have said that the word curse or accursed occurs 10 times. Well, there are three letters in that root, right? So it's Aleph, Resh, Resh, three letters when you write the word curse, the verbal form of that word. So if, you, if it's written 10 times and they're three letters long each, that's 30 letters, right? So I'm coming back to what Rolston said. So that's 30 of the 40, and the remaining 10 letters are used to write God, die, and Yahweh. So what he's saying is, look, they must have messed up because if you write the word curse 10 times and there's three letters every time you write it, that's 30 letters, and you've only got 10 letters left to write the words God, die, and Yahweh. And, and now you're going to go over. Well, let's look at this technically, okay? So the word God depends what word um, that the author used. There's di there are different words for God you could write, but it's usually going to be between two and four letters long. If it's the word uh, Elohim, then it's going to be four letters. So there's the word God, and so that's two to four letters. There's the word die, that's four letters, uh, and that's written twice. So that, uh, I, I'm sorry, um, that's two letters long, and it's written twice, so that makes four letters in the, uh, for the writing of die twice. Then the word Yahweh appears twice also, and that's three letters each. You double that, and that's six letters total. Now, what Rolston didn't mention, though, is that there are other words that should be accounted for. So we can go even beyond what he says to make it more seemingly absurd of what they're suggesting. So the this is what shrewd. you're doing right now, just for the audience. Uh, it sounds like Dr. Pet Petrovich is going to do what's called steel manning the argument, meaning make the opponent's argument stronger even than what it is before taking care of the steel man. Bingo. You can see right through me, but vocab. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's take care of the steel man. Yeah. So the word surely appears in the inscription. That's If it's the standard word for surely in Hebrew, that's two letters. And then almost certainly the word, the preposition, the, um, the bait preposition appears twice. And it's translated in their translation by. And again, I haven't seen the Hebrew. Okay, They haven't shown it to me. I, so it's invisible to me. I don't know about it as of my speaking now. But the word by should be there twice as a one letter um, preposition. So in total, that's two letters. Then they note that the word the appears, the article. That's really important because I found that in my Hebrew inscriptions that predate this inscription that are, that are found in Egypt and Sinai. I found the article the, which my critics told me, you can't have the article that early in Israel's history. Well, I've got news for you. It is that early in Israel's history. So the word the is there at least once, and that's one letter. So what do we what do we get when we add all of this up? All of these other words, apart from the word curse or cursed, that gives us 17 to 19 letters. So that brings us to a total of 47 to 49 total letters per Rolston's criticism, right? Because remember, the, the excavators and the epigraphers told us that it had to be 40 letters long. So we're seven to nine letters too many. But here's a fundamental flaw that Christopher Rolston makes that he would never make if he just bothered to read my book and <laughs> let some of it sink in. Wait, 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 wait. Are you talking about this book? Yes. Okay. The World's Oldest Alphabet. Sure. If, you, if he would have read that book, he would... He would discover that what he would know what I discovered, which is in just about every case where an ancient Israelite could write two letters back to back, they wouldn't write it. Like, for example, in English, if we write the word arrange, A-R-R-A-N-G-E, we're going to write R twice, aren't we? Well, the ancient Hebrews 
of this time, they wouldn't do that. No, we don't, we don't want to waste an extra R, you know, write it twice. Just write it once. It's enough. People will understand it's to be taken as twice. Our range, our range, right? You, 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 you speak it twice, but you read it, uh, but you write it once. So that's what they did. That was their, their tendency. Well, this word curse, as Rolston points out, it has two R letters in it. Aleph, Resh, Resh, R, R. But if you look at the history, at the earlier ancient Hebrew inscriptions, where they're not writing the R, R back to back, they're only writing it once. Mm. That then means 10 times we can drop out an R letter. So there are 20 le uh, less letters. So if the R in curse is always um, written once and not twice, right? We understand that it's doubled, but we only write it once. Then there would be what I count to be 37 to 39 letters, and probably 39 because most likely God is written as Elohim. I can just about venture a, a confident... Um, From the interviews I saw with Stripling, God was Elohim. And so uh, I'm going to... I want to... I don't want to get too far off on this... But I, I do want to ask you at some point how this relates to uh, the the documentary hypothesis because it's beautiful. Yep. In, in regards to that, but but so thirty nine. But you said there's forty, or are they saying about forty? Yeah, they're, they're saying there are exactly forty, and I'm saying I can count without seeing this in Hebrew. So you haven't seen count. it. You're saying for what we know now. Why doesn't Rolston know this? There you go. That's a great question because. He simply will not give credence to the to having any value in the scholarly work that I've presented to the to the scholarly community. He just rejects it carte blanche. Mo vocab. He rejected the thesis of my book before my book actually was in print, and he did this in public. So it shows you he's not an objective scholar. That's the bottom line. He's not an objective scholar. But is it, um, I don't know if I want to use the word common knowledge, but do other scholars who specialize in this understand of the dropping of, I don't know what to call it, double consonants in, in ancient Hebrew? Do they already know that? If they read my book, they did. But but, but I'm saying prior right. to your book, was that known prior to your book? Are you no. saying? No, was not known. I discovered it in the research and discovery phase. Now, that doesn't seem decidedly controversial. Some of your propositions are controversial. That doesn't seem decidedly controversial. It seems like some people would be agreeing with this, that at least that mm -hmm. element of your thesis, yes or no? Yeah, yeah, they should. Um, Gershon Galil should be the first among them because, as he pointed out in his article on the um, – the, uh, the uh, Pithos inscription from Jerusalem, from the, um, um, what's it called? All of a sudden I forgot. Anyway, he wrote an article on it. I wrote an article on it. And he, he admitted in there that the Israelites versus the Judites, the Israelites would write the word for wine, uh, y, y, no, y, n, yod, nun, mm. like y, n, for the word um, yayin, wine. But the Judites would write y, y, n, three letters, right? So they double the, uh, the, the original Y letter, the yod. Mm. So this is a and case of north versus south spelling exactly. differences. Yeah, exactly. And so that demonstrates that in 1000 BC or so, or a little after 1000 BC, in the 900s BC, that, um, that we already have this, this, um, this balance most of the Israelites are writing just one Y and others are writing it twice. So that same tendency, just picture that going back 500 years. It's the same thing, right? Mm. So it's not, it shouldn't be a problem to a scholar that, mm. that you're writing it once when you're pronouncing it twice. So is uh, Rolston uh, going to apologize when, it, when they show the Hebrew text? Because he's assuming they made a mistake. It's like uh, a lot of these guys I've seen view Stripling and his team as guilty before proven innocence, basically. Right. And I think that's yeah, because they he's— they make their arguments. And I think that's because he's what they might call confessional in the sense that, you know, this isn't evangelical to someone who believes the biblical record, whereas Rolston someone who's wrote for, you know, wrote for Huffington Post— 
And so there's obviously going to be some ideological differences. But at the end of the day, the dirt's the dirt. The rock's the rock. At least it should be. And um, I wonder if he's going to be like, well, well, my bad about that, you know? <laughs> yeah, think- and there could be several options. Either either he eats crow and he says that, or he just says nothing, and that's what I would expect. Or the, the, if he wants to really put himself out there and, and, and roll the dice, uh, he's going to object and call it all bogus and say that you can't do that. You can't have the, the, the writing of the letter once when it's supposed to be written twice, right? So he could go any one of those routes. But the bottom line is, um, if, if he would have just read my book, he would know, um, you know, you can do that. And, and that vocab is a really important um, affirmation for me that everything I'm saying in my first book is now fleshing out as plausible and believable and understandable once this uh, curse inscription is now. Yeah, so at the end of this, and I just have a few questions before we get there, I want to ask you about how this relates to some of the um, theories and ideas and, and propositions that you put forth, how that relates to that. But before we do exactly that... Um, uh, I want everyone to know that Stripling, uh, I'll put it colloquial, he hit, this is according to Stripling's interview, he hit Rolston up and said, do you want to take a look at this? And uh, I guess Rolston didn't respond or whatever. And then, you know, put out uh, critical material online in regards to it. And uh, Stripling said, well, he could have, you know, had a chance to see this, but now uh, he's going to have to wait like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. you know, they have been vetting this. Everyone, this was discovered in 2019, and we only heard about it two months ago. You know. Yeah, and you're right. Um, Scott Stripling invited Christopher Rolston to be part of the epigraphical team, part of the um, team that's, you know, writing this scholarly publication on it. And he never heard back from, from Rolston. So that shows you right away um, where Rolston was going to land. He, because, listen, here's the deal. If you're an epigrapher and you catch wind of this and some archaeologist flashes in front of, you know, flashes the carrot in front of the horse's mouth, what's the car- What's the horse going to do? The horse is going to grab with every ounce of strength it has to get that carrot, right? So he would have gone for it if he, this had any chance of landing where he would want it to land. He knew right away. This was going to nail his position and back him into a corner. So he had no choice but to excuse himself without even saying, excuse me. Well, this also may do damage to other, uh, you know, trending. I don't when I say trending. I guess I mean popular. I guess we might say mainstream uh, theories. For example, for example. Uh, the documentary hypothesis, sometimes referred to as Graf Wellhausen, this idea that you had multiple strands contributing to uh, the biblical documents in the Old Testament, specifically uh, Torah, and you have the Eloist, and you have this Yahwehist, or however they say it. And here, though, here you have Elohim and Yahweh next to each other way yeah. back in a day can you talk about i don't think i'm doing justice explaining this seems really damaging for that position now i watched a proponent of this here's what he said well you know this can't undo all the writing that's been done on the subject by proponents of the documentary hypothesis one find can't unravel all that that work and i was kind of thinking well yeah it can because rock beats paper right you know just yep. like this just like you know the old game Rock beats, well, actually, paper beats rock, but I'm saying, you know, I'm using it uh, euphemistically to refer to the archaeology that actually we discover upends like theories written on paper. That's what I was trying to get, mm-hmm. trying to be clever. So rock beats paper is the way I'm putting it in, in that sense. So help explain that because to me that's pretty significant. Yeah, and so the reference to assuming it's Elohim, Elohim Yehwa, uh, which of course is the God who exists in plurality, he who is. That's the translation, right? The God who exists in plurality, um, he, uh, I'm sorry, uh, no, the king of the gods who exists in plurality, 
he who is or the one who goes on existing. That's that's the translation of those words. But what what that demonstrates is that sometime around 1400 BC or slightly after, we already have Israelite people writing in Hebrew with the proto consonantal Hebrew script, which they took with them as they left Egypt in 1446 BC, that they were able to write, they were already writing the name of God in plural, speaking of one God, which no other ancient people did, vocab. The, the, Moses was the first person in history we know of who wrote of God with the name El. El is the king of the gods. That's the Canaanite word or, or the Levantine word for the king of the gods in all the pantheons of the Levant. Um, Moses was the first to turn that into a plural when referring to a singular God. Yeah, because it would be the plural noun, but with the singular, uh, what is it, singular verb? Isn't that well, how they did it? Am I, well, am I, am I saying it right? No. Well, the singular noun, el, has then a, a, um, a, a suffix added to it, which is im, and im makes it plural. So you're referring to one God in the plural, and that doesn't make sense in the ancient world. It just doesn't make sense. No, but I'm saying, isn't it the case that when they're referring to the God of Israel in regards to Elohim, they would use, there was a way they would let you know that it wasn't basically translated to English, gods. But God, meaning, wouldn't they put a? Uh, I, believe, I thought it was a, 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 a uh, something singular with it that let you know because because you could translate it as God or God, right? Right. But you could how translate do you know? it as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or gods like the gods of Egypt. Yeah, but the way you know is because I thought they when it's talking about the God of Israel, it would also have a uh, uh, something that was singular with it. With a plural. Yeah, maybe that was done later in, in time, but earlier, you know, pre 850 BC, no, nope, wasn't done. All right, so you're saying not Yahweh, but something else. Why is that? Well, I'm just pronouncing it the way it typically shows up in the Hebrew Bible, which is Yahuwah, Yahuwah. Um, and that is a masculine singular participle from the Hayat to be verb. So that's um, he who is or the one who goes on existing. And that's the covenant name. God reveals himself to Moses in Exodus 3 at the burning bush. And he says, in the first person common singular form, I am. And so when the Israelites talk to each other and they, they speak about the God who called himself I am, they use the third person masculine singular form, he who is. But you're, you, does anyone else pronounce it that way? I always hear people say Yahweh or sometimes Yahweh. Yeah. Lots of mistakes are made vocab, and I just like cleaning them up. That's so my you job. So you think it's wrong to pronounce it as Yahweh? Yeah, it's not as precise. And you, but you think it's de, do you think it's definitive to be able to say that? Like, do you think it's? Definitive? I say that with confidence. Yes. All right, all right, all right. Just like vocab, just like when when people use the Hebrew letter um, Wow, they often often pronounce it like a V sound, but it's not the V sound. It's not Vav, it's Wow. It's originally in the ancient Hebrew world pronounced W, not V. The reason people do that today, it's called a Germanization because mm. the Ashkenazi Jews coming from the Germanic speaking uh, countries, German speaking Germanic countries, um, they shifted it to their own pronunciation and we've walked away with that. You know, and embraced it. So, well, to a certain yeah. extent, that's common. That kind of thing does happen with languages. That yep. kind of evolution yep. or change in pronunciation. Yep. And it okay. all depends how much of a purist you want to be. I got you. Well, yeah, people like to debate about how, how to pronounce uh, Greek, you know, a more anglicized way or what people think sounds like classical or ancient Greek. But, okay, so... Um, we have this, and last thing before we talk about how this relates to you, uh, your specific ideas, this one will tie into that. Tell people, explain, because I don't think a lot of people, I don't know if they get this, lots of critics are saying, write the Torah. Moses didn't even have access to writing nothing if there was right. a Moses. What? Well, well, you know, but this shows, this shows Hebrews were writing a yeah. long time ago. Can yeah, it shows that? they were writing already the moment they walked into the land. Boom. They're already writing. It's it's true now we know from this Mount of Ball Curse tablet. Um, 
And it's true from the Lakish Milk Bowl Ostrakin, which I've published on and demonstrated that this is Hebrew. Um, and the last letter, the, I'm sorry, the last word in the inscription, uh, nofet, is the Hebrew word for honey. And it's not used as such by the other Semitic peoples, the other um, Semitic speaking um, um, peoples of the day. So these are two examples to demonstrate that the, the Israelites are already writing Hebrew when they walk into the land. And remember, God told them to, to write you know, on their doorposts. So that means the people, not just the, the most uh, elite of them, not just the elders of Israel or the, you know, the scribes of Israel or whatever, but the people are writing already before the Exodus. And all of that is abundantly clear if you understand that the earliest alphabetic inscriptions are Hebrew. And again, uh, as, I, as we probably talked about in our last episode, there are three biblical names vocab mentioned in the inscriptions that are in my book. Um, there's, there's, uh, the wife Asnath, the, the wife, it's actually in the, in the other book, that one, the world's oldest alphabet. Asnath, the wife of Joseph, she's mentioned in an inscription dating to 1776 BC. And then there's Ahisamach, uh, the father of Aholiab, one of the first, uh, one of the two men God appointed to build the tabernacle. He's mentioned. And then there's an inscription that mentions Moses. And that is another, to go back to your point about the destruction of the documentary hypothesis, the mention of Moses in inscription dating to the middle of the 15th century BC demonstrates that Moses was a historical figure, not just a figment of a later Hebrew's imagination wishing to create a glorious past that never happened. No, it did happen. And the fact we have Moses' name written in an inscription um, from Sinai uh, Sinai 361, that shows that we have a historical person who's able to write the Torah. I always think it's funny when people talk about, you know, Hebrew founding myths, you know, this glorious past that never happened. And I'm like, they were slaves for 400 years under a foreign power. And then when they got freed from their God, they whined the whole time until most of them dropped dead. <laughs> Right. And I'm always thinking that doesn't sound very glorious. If you're going to come up with a founding myth, it seems like you would need to come up with a, a different one. But, hey, I guess whatever. Uh, yeah. what, you know, whatever floats, you're right. floats your boat. It's, okay. it's the willful suspension of disbelief. That's what it is. So I'm trying to um, – uh, so, so let's talk about some of your specific uh, ideas because uh, I want people to understand uh, there's – there's things that you said today that I think, um, to some extent, mainstream so-called would accept. Other things that within maybe Christian or more faithful circles, uh, some would accept. And then other things that uh, sometimes not even maybe we'll call them fellow conservatives would accept. Not that they, uh, that, but but that you're putting forward. Uh, trying to have more people accept. And so you have some specific ideas about some of this stuff. And and you, I think, would say this is something you could have, I don't want to say predicted, but that, that, that accords with your model. That it's something you could say, you know, predict in the general sense of we'll find earlier stuff if my model is true or, you know, the, the, this is corroborative evidence. Can you explain how um, this would tie in for some things that you would specifically push and, and help people understand where maybe cre uh, fellow Christians might be along with you and where you're specifically pushing? Because I want people to understand some of the, maybe we'll say, unique aspects to what you hold hold to. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I want them to be able to parse that all out. But how does this relate to, to things you've written about? Sure. And I've written from, you know, my first uh, formal publication in 2006, I've... I've uh, stood on the pedestal saying, listen, the Exodus happened in 1446 BC. It's in the middle of the 15th century BC. 40 years later, you have the beginning of the conquest of Canaan starting in 1406. And, and that's kind of the platform from which everything builds. And I, I long ago said, Amenhotep II is the Exodus Pharaoh. Even before I wrote these two books that are just groundbreaking discovery after discovery, I still was saying, Amenhotep II, it has to be the Exodus Pharaoh because he's the only one who meets all the all the biographical requirements of the Exodus, and he lives uh, in the in, you know he, he reigns from the middle of the 15th century BC to you know 36, 37 years later. 
Um, so all of that I've, I've said all along. And then when my books came out, I was the first person really on a scholarly level who was saying, look, we've got evidence for Israelites in Egypt from 1876 to 1446. And here's all the evidence. We have four room houses, which were uniquely Israelite architecture. They show up there um, already in the middle of the 19th century BC in a building that Bryant Wood and probably David Roll and I are saying that's Jacob's house. Um, we have, um, we have uh, um, writings that are Hebrew that are found in Egypt, several places in Egypt and in Sinai. And then they're connected to the, the Asiatics who are living at Avaris. And, and I'm, I'm trying to prove that these are the Israelites. So all of this I've been saying for a long time now and have been saying, look, the, the Hebrew script was already in use um, from, the, from the middle of the 19th century BC all the way to the time of the, that the Israelites were ready to leave Egypt and then on into their time in Canaan. So when the Mount Ebal inscription comes along, it fits perfectly because I've said, look, Moses would have died by 1406 BC and Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And in the Pentateuch, Moses is the first to, um, you know, Exodus 3. He's the first to receive the covenant name of God from God himself. So when the covenant name of God shows up in an inscription that dates as early as 1406 BC, and it could date that early, or, you know, a, a decade later, a few decades later, whatever, several, um, that the, the mention of Yahweh, Yehwah, there, the covenant name of God, reinforces what I've been saying all along, that Moses has to die by 1406, that the Israelite uh, script is already in use, and he's written the, the Torah with it, and the Israelites are writing with it. And now, when we have such an inscription found at Nanabal, and these are the Israelites behind it, and they're writing in Hebrew, and they're writing the covenant name of their God, it fits together. It's just a new puzzle piece in the master puzzle that I and others have been trying to build for a long time now, and it fits perfectly. There's nothing vocab in my writings that I have to apologize for as a result of the Mount Ebal inscription. If there were, I would apologize, and I would do it publicly. But there's nothing I found. So what does that say? Well, it says you're no Christopher Rolston. <laughs> Granted. Shout out to Tony Tabano for the super chat in the house. Thank you very much, brother. You're the first and only, well, actually the first and second super chatter today. So much love for that. We really appreciate it. It's good to see you around, Python. Okay, so um, any questions from the audience? If you have a question, we can maybe get to one or two. You put a capital Q with a colon and then a question mark at the end of the sentence. That's how we do the questions. That's how we were able to get to them. Final concluding thoughts on the Mount Ebal find and the curse tablet. Kind of summarize everything together. Let's say someone's even just joining us. Break it down one last time, and we'll see if we get any questions. Yeah, so we have a very small lead um, inscription that was found at Mount Ebal, the place where the Israelites went uh, under Joshua to, to bring about the curses. Um, it was found. It dates to either the end of the late Bronze Age one, so around 1400 BC or slightly after that. And this inscription, um, wouldn't you know it, it presents a curse. Someone or some people were cursed either by Joshua or by someone after him, Israelites after him. And this cursing is, shows up in this, this inscription. And the inscription names their God whom they want to appeal to in this cursing so that that God, their God, that's Elohim, um, the king of the gods who exists in plurality by name, he who is the one who goes on existing. That God, we appeal to him to bring about this, this terrible result on these certain people because of the probably the things they did to us. So we're, we're invoking God to um, bring, bring retribution, right? Justice for the, for the wrongdoers. So bring about bad things on people who did bad things because that's justice. So that's the inscription that was found. Um, it's revolutionary, um, 500 years older, uh, the, the oldest attested um, inscription to, to the covenant name of God. We now go back. 
from, from that 500 years earlier um, or more. And so um, this is an extremely important find, and we'll be excited to see the publication at the end of the summer. Uh, what if someone says, well, you know, this was like found out of context, meaning not at the site anymore. Now, obviously, the contention would be originally was at the site. Someone could have dropped this in there. This could be like a set for a forgery or something. What's the argument against that? You know, they got well, this trash pile arguments. sitting around. Um, yeah. So on, a, on the simplistic level, to say it's out of context and it's so you can't even put it into a certain period, the argument against that would be, well, here's the thing. It was found in a dump pile that's connected to the actual altar itself. And the altar has only two periods of occupation. It's the late bronze occupation, which is, again, the end of LB1 or beginning of LB2, late bronze 1 or late bronze 2, around 1400 BC, or um, um, some, yeah, sometime shortly after that. And the, or, uh, the, the second option is that it could be connected to the 1250 BC altar. So that's possible too. So those are your only options that you have to work with because there's no other archaeological context that you can connect it to. But if you say, yeah, what if somebody dumped it into the pile, then I would say this. Um, that would require probably the most incredible master deceiver that we've ever seen in this field. Because to inscribe this with letters that the letter, the letter hey or H letter, that's the three letters uh, vocab in what they've released so far in that, that covenant name of God there. That is specifically in a form that's different than any other attested form. There's no other inscription earlier than this. And all the inscriptions that are in my book and that are in um, other books, such as um, by um, Albright and others, no exact replica of that form where the arm that to us looks like the right arm, the right arm is cut off. And so, you know, it's, there's a stub right here. Right. Yeah, the, that little. Hold on, that, it looks like he looks like Jim Abbott. You remember Maybe the picture so. picture from the Angels back in yeah. the day? I I wouldn't have gone there, but yeah, you could go there, I suppose. <laughs> it's the Jim right. Abbott inscription. Exactly. And what forger? What forger? Even if he could find lead to do this on, and he could he could you know he he, he could you know have it at at um, the the temperature where where lead is pliable, if he did it there and he could inscribe these letters, he wouldn't inscribe it like this. He would copy one of the other forms of the letters that actually does show up where you don't have the stub right arm, where you have full right arms extending up in the position of praise. And that's what it means. It's the, it's the Hallel letter, which means praise. It's the verb praise in Hebrew. That's the basis of the Hebrew letter for H, Hallel, H, huh, mm. Hallel, praise. Okay. And that's what you did in Egypt. You raised your arms. So no forger would would be stupid enough to to inscribe the letter in such a way that it wouldn't be attested, right? Because anybody could just pop up. A, a, an expert could pop up and say, it wasn't attested like this before. So it can't be the H letter, the halal letter, right? The forger wouldn't be that stupid. So all of this to say, Again, it's the willful suspension of disbelief. If you're going to believe a critic on this, that this would have been planted, you know, prepared ahead of time, forged and planted, um, you know, you would have had to have a genius who would put himself at risk writing letters and forms that we, we don't see so that he could, you know, pull this off. Well, you said may, it would take the most ingenious uh, deceiver, ever, a deceiver ever associated with archaeology. Maybe uh, in the '90s, Ron Hyatt went. Ron Wyatt went in there and dropped it in there. <laughs> it's a surprise that he didn't discover this, right? Yeah. Well, I did hear people say, "Well, this sounds too too good to be true." I did yeah. hear well, some people say, "Guess that. what? Guess what?" In in the what is it? The end of the 19th century, when they found the Mernapta Stella that mentions Israelites. Yeah. That was too good to be true. But here we are over 100 years later, and nobody is doubting it. What about 100 years from now, vocab? Who's going to be stupid enough to doubt this? Michigan fans. Michigan fans. Bingo. You got it. You hit it on the dot. <laughs>
Yeah. Right on. All right. Any other questions? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand this question, so you may not be able to answer, but maybe you can help. Uh, would the tense in God's name be used to avoid saying God's name? Or maybe the beginning of the tradition? But I don't know what they mean. I th- know what they mean by so, tense. Um, there name. is no tense in a noun. Yeah. God's name is a noun. This doesn't um, make sense. Although, uh, wait, let me, let me step back. Let me step back. Okay. Um, th- there's tense in a finite verb. And the name of God is not a finite verb. It's actually a participle. But, and, and a participle has qualities of a verb and qualities of a noun. But one of the qualities of a verb it doesn't have is tense. There's no tense with it. So um, in the covenant name of God, no, no tense. There is, um, uh, there's person and number. So it's a third person singular, uh, masculine singular. I'm sorry, not, not third person. It's, it's masculine singular um, participle. So there's that much to it, but that's all we have th- that we know so far. And again, there's no tense. Yeah, no tense in God's name, although some of the ancient Israelites did live in tents. True. <laughs> Shout out to there. Karen Weiss. Shout out to Karen Weiss for the super chat as well. Okay, so uh, let's see. What are you talking about coming up in the future? Um in regards to your work and uh, what else do you see coming out with this? Because they still haven't actually told us everything that's on here yet. There's, right. there's more to be. So, so talk about the future of this and then the future of your work and we will end there. Okay. Yeah. The future of this is summer of 2022, end of the summer. We, supposedly we're going to see a journal article that gives us all of this inscription, all the important information. And it, if they do it right, Every single letter will be drawn out, probably by Gershon Galil, the, the three-letter um, tetragrammaton for the name of God. That's that's a drawing by Gershon Galil. Here, I'm so he'll probably have screen. all of the letters, you know, spelled out. So you will see that in its full entirety, all 40 letters on the inside, and whatever letters are on the outside that they're going to document and talk about for us, um, you, you'll you'll have those discussed. And the context will be discussed, the issues, the criticisms that have come out, some of them will be um, anticipated or, or, or addressed. So, so there's that. With my work, uh, I'm finishing a book on Nimrod right now. And so hopefully within a few months, um, that will be in print. Um, um, and, and Nimrod is one of those figures, he's in Genesis 10, that people want to know, who is this guy? Who in ancient history is Nimrod? And I'm going to discuss this at great length uh, in this short book on Nimrod. So it's called. It's going to be called Nim, Nimrod the Empire Builder. Hmm. Nimrod the Empire Builder. Uh, that book must already be done if it's going to be published in a few months, right? It's it's almost done. Yes, and we're putting it on the fast track. A lot of um, people that get into Afrocentric Bible interpretation say because of Nimrod's uh, lineage that he must have been black. I don't know if you've ever heard that. I don't think it's necessarily related to scholarly work, but... Yeah, and you, you know what's connected to that vocab? You're right. It's it, There are some scholars, especially uh, late 19th century, early 20th century to mid 20th century, who kind of go down that road. And it's all because of his connection to Cush. Cush yeah, is part of his heard. genealogy. Yeah. And what scholars did is they connected that Kush of the genealogy to Kush in Africa, where there is a, a um, black nationality there in the land of Kush. So that connection has caused people to connect Nimrod with him. But that's a bad connection because in Mesopotamia itself, which again is where Abram is from, right? right. He comes from Ur of the Chaldeans, Mesopotamia. You have a people group based at a city, a site called Kish, which is exactly the same in the consonants, and that's all that's, that really is communicated clearly in the ancient writings. So Kish is the same as Kush in its consonants. You have the site and, and the people of, of Kish who are actually, um, they, they take center stage at the end of what's called the early, early dynastic period in Mesopotamia's history. And it's there that Nimrod almost certainly comes from. So Nimrod comes not from Cush in Africa, 
Nimrod comes from Kish in Mesopotamia, that place where they were on the verge of being um, a, a, a dynasty and, and on the verge of starting an empire. Power was taken away from them just before they could get to that point where they're starting to conquer all the peoples around them. But soon after them, um, this guy um, named, named Sargon of Akkad, he accomplishes what they couldn't, right? And he conquers all of the ancient peoples around them. And it just so happens that he is the one I will be trying to prove is biblical Nimrod. Oh, you're going to say Sargon of Akkad is Nimrod? Sargon of Akkad. Oh, well, it's easy to say in English, Sargon of Akkad is Nimrod. So what about, uh, you get this in like uh, a lot of the Jack Chick type publications that Nimrod's the founder of all like false religions. Have you ever heard of this? That all, yeah. it all goes back to and, him? Yeah, and you know what that's like? That's like um, my grandfather's f fish story, right? When he told the story, the fish was this big. Right. When my dad told it, the fish was this big. Yeah, no. And when I tell it, the fish is this big, right? So it's one of those things that there's just this strange tradition that comes about. People have ideas and they want to put them out there. They want people to hear what they have to say and, you know, baptize their ideas and, you know, christen them. But usually the ideas aren't that great to start with or they have no real foundation or basis. This is one of those traditions that has no basis. It's just... The other thing, uh, maybe you can explain in your book, why do people uh, refer, like they'll say Nimrod, this is kind of older, but as if the person's dumb. Yeah, it's a colloquial term. You're, you know, <laughs> what you're trying to do, you Nimrod. Yeah. Right? That kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. it all goes back to this terrible person who existed in the Bible that, you know, we haven't talked much about, but people want to know about. Well, this will be fascinating to see, and I'm sure it'll make you a lot of friends. Yep. So, <laughs> and, yeah, friends and enemies, huh? Yeah, yeah. All right, so everyone, uh, shout out to Dr. Douglas Petrovich. Check him out, especially on Twitter. And uh, you definitely want to pick up his works here. Check him out on academia.edu. And uh, we will talk again because I know the people want to hear from you again, and I appreciate your time very much, my friend. My pleasure, Vocab. Thanks for having me. All right. God bless. Have a beautiful day. Talk to you later. Right. Okay, everyone. I'm going to do one freestyle and then get out of here just because you guys earned it. Okay. Are we ready? Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. Here we. Here we. Yeah. Vocab talking about. Scare rabs, Jews and Arabs Take a stab at a new theory Turn up the volume, you hear me Clearly, steer the conversation To uh, excavation in the land Where of Israel Talking about nouns and vowels Doctor, he knows them well Save your soul if you're going to hell The Bible that's where we read it Found an inscription, you best believe it I'm ripping, speaking of Scott stripping However you say it, you know don't be tripping Rocking on and on like the dude on his blog Christopher Roston, he's got a One, two, three, four Eat some crow, in case you don't know Four, oh, that's forty Check it out now, for the shorty We're discussing it Antiquity, will it's vocab Malone and mention me as the weirdest YouTuber in the history of this whole enterprise? It's a mystery how I got 30k followers. Today's the day, maybe David Wood had something to do with it. Check it, one, two, speaking about the ancient Jew, the ancient Hebrew, and their crew. Yes, y'all, from the rock of Gibraltar, talk about Joshua's altar. Don't falter for the sons and daughters. Go to the altar, grab the water, then do like a ritual. It's vocab Malone, I'm spitting full. They even left some victuals there check it out no skittles because they had poor scene you know what i mean upon the scene what do we see it's strictly kosher the coast of nostra rock the mic i give a car like oprah 
and I hope uh, this was edifying, electrifying, defying like evil, Knievel, peep this for the people, fly like an eagle, that's what Edom do, check it out, Obadiah, one, two, the crew, we spit this true, shout out to the squad, the SA crew, Nate 2D2 plus D new, and Conrad's B in the house, they true, ah. Rockin', speaking upon like rocks in, rocks in Sam and wet screening. Peep this out, you know I'm bleeding, you know I'm leaving this scene. Here we go again, it's not obscene, cause it wasn't discussing Hebrew. Israelites, you know the type, rock it on the mic. One, two, don't keep it trite, we gotta keep it right for the black and white, and plus the brown, the yellow, mellow, my mellow fellow. Play the cello, okay, rock the mic, do a curse, hell no. Haha, <laughs> get it, I like a thello. White to black when we bright back when we hit the mic upon a hype track made by Soko. Initial J S is fresh. I see the matrix and the US. Well I confess, talking to Dr. Petrovich. Yes, y'all. First name Doug. He's an archaeologist. You know he dug, dig, dug like the old arcade. We out today, today, Thursday. Ah!